If you want to learn how to extract the best possible information from your data, from your tabular data, and create high performance machine learning models, this video will teach you everything I know about it. My name is Mario, I'm a Kaggle Competitions Grandmaster and multiple time prize winner, and every prize I won in any machine learning competition, I can say that the number one reason was because of developing the feature engineering skill. Every time I created a high performance model for a consulting job or for any job that I had, the most important part after, of course, understanding the business problem and actually solving the right problem was how to extract the maximum information from any data that I had available to solve that problem. This is definitely one of the most important and more art than science parts of creating machine learning models. So let's begin. I tell you, I have to tell you, this is not a code tutorial because what you learn here, you can apply in SQL, in Spark, in R, in Pandas, in whatever language you already work or will work in the future. What I want here is to teach you how to think, teach you how to reason about this, give you a strategy and tactics so that you can actually extract these representations from your data in the problems that you have that include structured tabular data. The first part of this tutorial will be a more abstract part, a more framework part, kind of giving you a template, a blueprint for you to think about this in any cases that you have to solve, that you have tables. And in the second part, I will show you a real example in with data from Facebook, a bot competition, bot detection competition that really gave me a lot of insight in the about feature engineering and how it affects machine learning. So let's begin. The first question that you have to ask yourself is about the keys that you have. And why I say the keys, what are these keys? It's creating data, creating features for tabular data is all about aggregation. So every time this was a, a game changer for my machine learning skill, when I started thinking about all the tables that I had as how can I aggregate this data and extract information by aggregating. And this will be very clear to you after this tutorial. In more practical terms, we can think about aggregation as the usual group by function that we have in a lot of our languages to, to deal with tabular data. The basic concept is whatever tables you have, you will need to find the keys to join these tables and you need to find the variables that you can group by and actually extract some operation, some function over the values of some other columns that you have. Let me give you an example to make this more clear. Let's say that you work for a credit card company and you are trying to predict fraud. After looking at the tables that you have available, you have tables of transactions of your customers. You have a table of customers of your credit cards. And let's keep only at these two so that we can understand this in a more simplified way. So in this transaction data set, you have both a transaction ID a customer ID for each row, I'm saying this, the transaction value, the currency of the transaction, the location, the time of the transaction, and you can have many more, uh, many more places like the merchant ID, the machine ID, where the, the transaction occurred, if it was online, if it was offline, you have a lot of data, but you have this log of transactions. And for the customer, you have, of course, the customer ID, and you have the address, how many credit cards this person has, any information that is related to the customer. So how can you create this model by aggregating data? So the first thing you have to think is what are the keys that I will need to do a join, to do a merge here? And you will predict this for each transaction. So our key will be transaction ID and we will have customer ID too. So for each transaction of a given customer, you will need to create features so that you can predict if this transaction is fraud or if it is a regular transaction of this customer. One feature, for example, that you can calculate here is let's aggregate on customer ID and let's take, for example, how many transactions a, customers, a customer usually does in a period of a month. So here we have one feature. So if a customer is usually doing 10 transactions a month, and suddenly he's doing 10 transactions in a day, probably there is something wrong. Then why I say about keys? Because then you have, a, you have a row with the customer ID and the number related to this information that we just computed and that you can join with the row of the transaction that you are trying to predict next if it is fraud or not. In a more technical term, this would be a group by customer ID and then you can use count or size if you are using pandas, count 
over the rows. In this case, it can be over customer ID. But you don't need to only aggregate over one variable. You can aggregate over many variables. So for example, let's say that we want to understand if this customer usually makes transactions internationally or if his transactions are usually only domestic. In this case, we would use the group by. We can aggregate for by customer ID and currency, and we can count. And we can count how many times a customer actually made a transaction in a given currency. And then we can, for example, uh, create a, a table to join where we have, for example, the number of transactions in dollars, in British pounds, etc. So if a customer usually only transacts in dollars, probably if you see a transaction that is in Canadian dollars, well, maybe this is not a big problem. Canada and US are close by. Maybe the customer is over the border or something like this. But if you see the same customer actually transacting in Chilean pesos or Brazilian reais, probably it is an indication that something is at least different. It may be, it may still be the customer, but maybe it's not. So this is the general framework that I want you to think about these features. It's all about aggregation. You can take the median, you can take the average, the maximum, the minimum, the entropy of any columns aggregated by any other columns that you have in your data set. Usually you will aggregate over categorical columns or ordinal columns. Of course, aggregating over numerical columns, usually it is not very feasible, but I think you get the idea from here. And just to be complete, I have to tell you that, for example, if you have categorical data, you can actually do a one-hot encoding. You can do count or frequency of your data, like the examples that I'm giving you here. So for example, the count of currencies, we could, for example, take the amount of the transactions and say, okay, usually this customer buys, uh, every purchase of this customer is actually around $50. So if this customer is suddenly spending $5,000 in one transaction, uh, it may be an anomaly. Of course, this is what the machine learning model will decide, but you have to put this type of feature so that it can capture this kind of pattern if it is an indicator of fraud. And you have, of course, the target encoding, which is very popular on Kaggle because it's highly effective when it actually works. Another thing I want you to remember from this is that time. Time, you can treat just as an ordinal variable and even a categorical variable. I know categorical variables have no order and etc. but for our purposes, think about time as a discrete ordinal sequential variable. What does this mean? This means that it is just a list of numbers, a list of data. So if you have a day, you can have day one, day two, day three, day four. Always think about it as just another ordinal variable. And you can group by, by, by this ordinal variable. So for example, you can get how much money someone spends in a day. You group by time and take the sum of the amount of the transactions that these people has in their credit card in our example. There are four types of variables that I usually like to recommend. One is the lag. If you think about it, it's just a group by and a shift of the, of the data. So lag is simply saying, okay, what was the end time, the end value of this variable uh, across time. So for example, if we have a list of 10 transactions, what was the value of the last transaction would be a lag of one. If you get the 10th transaction, it would be a lag of 10. So lags can be applied to sequences in general, and time is just another way to order a sequence. Another feature that I usually like is the difference. So difference is just like lag, but uh, instead of just taking, for example, the last transaction, you take the last two transactions and subtract one from the other. So what's the difference in transactions from this current transaction to the last one? So it's just a difference, simple difference. It's very effective for machine learning. Another one that I like is the rolling. So a moving average is a classical example. And if you think about this as the sequence that I'm telling you, you can think about rolling as just taking a given window of the data that you have and actually computing an aggregation. Remember, aggregation is over everything here. So think about it. When you have a time series, you just have to think about aggregations, but now you have another dimension that you can aggregate. You have time, so you can still aggregate, but now you have a time aware aggregation that you have. And the last one, the last two, let's say, uh, I said four, but actually we can think about five of them. Uh, the other one is date components. So the specific date that something actually occurred, some 
there are some patterns depending on the types of data that you are dealing with that are more common in weekends. For example, uh, sales usually have some seasonal patterns across uh, when you are getting to Black Friday or when you are getting to Christmas. So there are seasonal patterns and you can capture them with date components. This is another type of uh, extraction that can be used in an aggregation, but can be used as a uh, an independent column. So for example, extracting the month of a date. So today is 2021, July 15. So I can take, for example, only the year or only the month and try to capture some kind of seasonality. In agriculture, this can be important because we have different seasons in the year. Uh, if you are selling fashion items, of course, you will have different fashion items that you should recommend depending on the season of the year. So this can be one way to tell it to your model. And the fifth one that I told it is just an additional is actually the fifth one is the time difference. So now instead of taking the difference, let's say uh, the positional difference, like we are we were doing with the leg, we are talking about taking a, a difference between dates. So let's say that you have uh, the transactions again of our credit card fraud case, and you can compute how much time have has passed, how much time has passed since the last transaction on how usually what's the average time between transactions of this customer, how long has been since this customer actually made a purchase in this currency or how long it has been since this customer actually made any purchase. This can be important too. So for example, I have a credit card that I only use for something like Spotify subscription and uh, it has been months since the only charge in that credit card is actually a Spotify subscription. So if someone, if suddenly I have three transactions buying some game coins in a random internet game, probably it is a fraud, not only because of course it is a thing that I'm not usually buying, but it is a big number of transactions suddenly and uh, the time between these transactions is actually completely different from what the credit card company is used to seeing in my profile. So let's go to the example that I told you so that you can see this in practice. And it is actually a great ex exercise for you to do. An exercise that uh, I will recommend is take some tabular data competitions from Kaggle, look at the solutions that are shared and try to reverse engineer how people computed the features that they are telling you that they computed. And I will give you an example here. So this is a, a competition that happened six years ago. It's the Facebook recruiting. The idea was given some bids in a given auction, you had to determine if a, if a user was a person or a machine. So this site, this data was from a website where people where the company did not want bots to actually bid in the auctions. So you had to determine. So they wanted to identify it with machine learning to identify if the users were using some kind of illegal software so that they could block these users from bidding at the auctions. So it's a huge data set, huge for not for the, the size today, but it has 7.6 million bids. And uh, it's actually a tiny data set after you do your data processing. And we have basically two tables. We have the bidder table. So we have the ID of the bidders. This can be compared to the customer ID in our previous example, we have the payment account. It's an identifier of the account that the, the payment information of the user, the address and the outcome. So was this user a bot or was this user a human? But the most important part for us here is the bid data set. It's where I actually extracted most of the features and the winners actually extracted most of the features from. So we have a data set that has a bid ID, a bidder ID. So like we said about the transactions, it's a transaction ID and the user ID, the customer ID in this case. The auction that this customer was participating. So we can think about this as let's say the merchant where the person actually made a purchase on the credit card. And this will change, of course, case by case, depending on what you are modeling. But I'm trying to keep this very, very general here so that you can use it in any tabular case that you have where you have to extract features from multiple tables. And then you have device, time, country, IP, URL, the category of the auction, everything. So let's see how a very brilliant uh, woman, a small yellow duck, she actually created a very, very good solution. She took the second place in this competition and she actually wrote an article that I will link in the, in the description of this video with her solution. And it has the code if you want to look at how she computed these features. And let's do the exercise that I told you about trying to reverse engineer the features that she computed based on our aggregation framework. So the first 
feature here is the median time between a user's bid and of course these are only some of the features these are not all the features you can see all the features and she has a, a great the she made some plots and a very very good explanation in the article but uh, here let's see this feature the features that she described here so the median time between a user's bid and the user's previous previous bid so like i told you about the case of the transactions where you calculate the time between transactions in a credit card so let's try to translate this into a group by so she did a group by and you can pause the video and try to do it yourself before seeing the solution but <laughs> i will tell you here how i would do it so she made a group by on user so in this case be their id this actually gave her a data frame let's think about this as data frame this actually gave, gave her a data frame of all the bits that this user had in the data set and then the aggregation that she did was first she computed the difference between the time of each of these bids so at this point we have bid 1 bid 2 bid 3 so she took the difference of all these bids and then with the differences she actually calculated the median at the end she had a data set that had the user and this new feature the median time between bids basically second feature the mean number of bids a user made per auction how did she compute it let's take our group by in this case user and I, I will here use the, the pandas notation, that is the one that I'm mostly familiar with. So she grouped it by user, by auction, and she took the size operation or the count. Depends on missing data and some details of pandas, for example. So this gave her an user auction size table that she could merge with the original data. And to finalize, I will take a uh, third feature here. So let's take the group by and let's take this, the fraction of IPs used by a bidder, which were also used by another user, which was a bot. This one is a more complex one. So she had to group by user IP and she probably computed size. So she had this. So let's say that she filtered. Filtering is another way of telling, of saying that you are selecting some rows, but let's say that she filtered a data set that had only users that were bought so the outcome was one in this case then what she did was probably this she took the first one and we you can do an inner join for example or some kind of filtering so that you get only the rows that correspond to this filter and then after this you have a, a table that has only these users but you have the user the ip and this you have user ip and the size but only for users that actually were bots and then you can take this and merge over the original data by ip so in the original data you had user you had auction you had uh, ip and you can actually merge this merge this the result of this one above with this data and then you can actually create another indicator that can tell you if any of these ips actually were a bot were used by a bot before so this one is a more complex one, but I wanted to show you how you can go deep into these features, how you can compute very, very deep features. You don't have to limit yourself to just one or two or even three categoricals to group by, to aggregate. You can do many, many aggregations and then try basically everything in your model. Uh, as you are learning this, it is very important that you use some kind of reference. So I will leave here some, uh, I'll leave a link to this feature tools documentation. Feature tools is a library that tries to automate this process of aggregation and extraction from of features from multiple tables. I have not used this in production, so I don't know. I can't tell you if it is very good, very bad, whatever. But what I can tell you is it has a lot of these lists. They are trying to automate this. So they have in the documentation a list of feature primitives of variable types that you can actually compute. So you can see what types of aggregations they do, what types of variables they are using and join all this together. So what kind of aggregations they usually do for a categorical variable, for example, and they have a lot of examples, both to predict customer churn, to predict next purchase in, in many, many areas. It's very, very good for you to learn feature engineering. I really don't understand why this, this library is not more popular. And I'm not sponsored by them. I'm not being paid to tell you this. I just know from my experience that I really wish I had something like this when I was learning. So I'll leave this link below. And to finish this video, I want to tell you that there are, there are two other types of features that may be interesting to you that I will not cover here because it goes a little bit too deep into specific cases, which are geolocation features. So for example, have assigned distance to calculate distance between two places on earth, 
or some other kinds that I can imagine of spatial data features that you can extract. So there are basically two dimensions that we usually see in real data. So uh, so real data can be spatial and can be usually bound by time. So you have to, to know some ways of computing uh, some geolocation features to help you. So the distance, for example, from points of interest, the distance of a customer from a given store or from his home can be important in a given model. And we have a new type of feature, not a very new type, but something that has been more popular. And I've seen some very, very good solutions on Kaggle that use them, which are network or graph features. So you put your data into a graph and you can actually do some aggregations actually, uh, or something like aggregations that you can ex use to extract uh, some information from the data. So for example, when we are trying to identify in our case here on Facebook, this last feature that I tried to explain to you about the IPs, it could be a graph, a graph where the nodes could be IPs and the edges, it could be a graph where the nodes could be users and the graphs, the edges could be IPs, uh, the edges could be IPs. So if a user actually uses the same IP as another user, it would have an edge on our graph. If not, of course it would not have, and we could compute a lot of metrics about it. So the edge degree and a lot of the, the node degree, actually a lot of features that are specific to graphs that can actually help our model to predict. We can just put into a table and actually use it in a model. So please uh, think about this graph features too. I may make a video only about them, but they are basically uh, aggregations, but at a different, let's say level that we have, but they are ever more important. Another thing that I want to tell you is that uh, an advanced example for you to try this exercise of trying to reverse engineer these features is actually looking at the Instacart competition, mainly the Kazuki Onodera solution, where he describes in detail and actually has published code of the features that he used to take I think the second place in the Instacart competition. And it's a very, very good exercise for you to learn how to do this feature engineering in more tables and uh, including the time dimension too, like we've seen here. And if you want something specific about time series forecasting, I will leave a link to my specific video on my specific workshop on time series forecasting here that you're going to watch now. Just click the link. If you like this video, please leave your like, subscribe to the channel, turn on the notifications and give your comment here. Uh, thank you for watching and have a wonderful day.